right here in the birthplace of football. We've got all the best action from North Central Ohio and beyond coming up on an all-new season of the Friday Night Pigskin. My name is Brian Skaronski, and tonight we are going to preview a lot of the top teams right here in our own backyard and the surrounding areas, the teams that we are going to focus our coverage on throughout the entire high school football regular season and into the playoffs. And I got the whole crew with me as always. What's up, gang? <laughs> talking, so how you doing, Brian? How you yeah, doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We'll get our professionality up as the It's been like, what, five weeks along. since we've done a live stream, so, you know, we got to get back into it. Well, a guy that's always got his game face on joining us tonight as well, the star of the Friday Night Pigskin, who you can catch in Coach's Corner all season long. How about Eric Will in the house? It's great to be here, man. What's Another up, year, man. Man, I can't wait. Another year. So, Eric, go ahead. Put your coach's cap back on because that's what we like to use you for is all of that knowledge that you gain from your time as a head coach and then an assistant. And, you know, we're one week away from the kickoff to high school mm -hmm. football season. What's important right now? What are coaches really trying to get done? Finalizing, finding starters where – you may not know where those starters are right now. Continuing to get your scheme all locked away. Now you're starting your prep for game week. So you're finalizing for your scrimmages that are taking place tonight, tomorrow. And then you're also going to be getting ready for your first week on Friday. So, you know, it's uh, – and everything's been uh, uh, sped up because, uh, you know, the, sh the, 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 the preseason has shrunk because we've added the, the rounds of the playoffs. So, um you know, it, it, it's full speed ahead. And, and, and not that that's any different than normal, but for the coaches right now, it's just um, trying to find out that next guy up in your, on your roster and how are they going to help you throughout the season. Well, the first conference that we're going to take a look at here tonight, Eric, is the OCC. And with New Philly joining the league, how does that shake things up and make it a little bit more deeper? Well, what do you see with the Quakers entering the league? How is it going to change? Yeah, it's going to add uh, another solid program. That's a, you know, I, I know a lot of people, when you think of New Philly, you automatically think of Dover. It's one of the longest rivalries in Ohio high school football. Uh, but uh, with them being added to the OCC, it just adds another top flight program to an already incredible league that's, you know, sometimes we talk about parity. I think you have top end parity in the OCC, and New Philly's going to add to that. All right, we're going to go ahead and dive into our first team preview of the night. I think maybe one of the favorites in the OCC this year, the Mansfield T.Y. Tigers. I was over at practice yesterday. Here's what I saw. Big confidence with this squad, would you say? You guys got big expectations heading into the year? Yeah, big expectations. Supposed to go far. We had them last year too, but this year even bigger. Got the same team coming back too. We've done a lot of work, and our improvement from last year to this off season has been really good. We've been just focused on the mental stuff, and then uh, these uh, two days we've been going really hard, and, and then um, we got really physical. So it's been really good. We had a scrimmage versus uh, Columbus. Um, and went really good. Offense, we're, we're just starting to pick it up, but defense is still solid like last year. Uh, I've seen a lot of improvement. Our offensive line the past couple years hasn't been the greatest, but I feel like we're going to pick that up this year. We got a new quarterback. He's looking real good for us. And I mean, we got a short senior class, but all the seniors we got are putting in their 100% like, effort. I've definitely been seeing a lot of O-line improvements and adjustments. and. Uh, Quarterback play has been getting a lot better recently since the beginning. And offensively, we just keep chopping, keep going in the right direction every day. Good practice, just focus on winning the day. Season's just like 10 days away. You feel like mindsets are changing a little bit out here, and if so, how? Yeah, we, uh, we're having better practices. We uh, like more like every day, we're just getting better, ready for the, for the first week of Norwalk. As soon as the first week hits, first Norwalk, we got to go down there. We're just going to be super focused. On so right now we're just getting focused. Any bold predictions for me about that Norwalk game? A lot to nothing. <laughs> A lot to nothing. I like the confidence. Well, clearly more than a lot of optimism, I think, out there in Tiger country. You hear Lala picking a lot to a little. Chav, you got to see these guys in person at a scrimmage just uh, last week. What's your overall expectations for the Tigers heading into the season? Well, I saw them against uh, Columbus St. Francis de Sales. 
and they their defense it's a ty tiger defense brian they're fast they're physical and they swarm to the ball and on the offensive side they have a couple big guys on the outside wide receivers they have some versatile smaller backs they got a quarterback and duke reese that can thread the needle when he wants to the offensive line if they can get better week by week we keep saying that i think this is a team that can make a run well, 9-3 and three last year, they made a mini run in the playoffs. Eric, are you going over or under nine wins for the Tigers in 2022? Well, to piggyback off what Travis just said, to me, Duke Reese is the X factor. If he balls out, because I've been hearing about him for two years, and I know he's got the size, the arm strength, the talent. We know they've got the athletes. Their defense never disappoints. I'm going over. I'm going over nine wins. Uh, I, I think that the, when you include the playoffs in that, uh, I, th I think that this is a really, really good football team. I think that what they have coming back and with Duke Reese and what we're anticipating him being under center, I, I, I don't think that there's a team in the area that's going to be poised to be any better than they are uh, night in and night out. Their schedule's brutal, Oof. though. There's no doubt about that. But I think that if, if this team is going to be good enough to navigate that. They just got to stay healthy and, and stay confident and just stay dialed into each and every week. And I think they're going to be fine. The first four weeks for the Tigers, Oof. it is murderer's row on the yes, road at Norwalk. Is. Then they come home, North Canton, Hoover, Maslin, and then they go to play at West Holmes. By the way, we're going to have all those games live and free right here on the OH Report. We're going to have all the Ash and Arrow games live for their home contest anyways as well and we checked them out bit of a struggle last year through the 2021 campaign just three wins but a little bit higher expectations heading into the new year Oh, it's nice, definitely, after a long summer. We do all of our seven-on-seven -seven stuff, just getting timing down, getting pass routes, but nothing's like actually going out and hitting people. So getting the pads on, lines full go, running routes full go, it's, it's just good to be back. So our major downfall last year was our line. Our line just was not there, and we really paid for it. We went three and seven. Um, we're looking better already this year. We're really excited about that. Uh, basically, I'm just taking every moment in. It's like... Uh, two nights ago we had our Midnight Madness, so that's the last time I'll ever get to do that. So just taking it slow, one step at a time, just trying to enjoy the moment each day as it goes by. Um, obviously, you know, we won't go as far as we can, but everybody's trying so hard to make every block count. We want everybody to remember the last time we hit them, our last game. So say it's our last time ever playing this team, which most of us it will be. We want to remember the last time we hit them so hard. Yeah, Garrett, so we were out at Ashland. I mean, they, they look like they're, they're ready to make a run here in the OCC. So, uh, you know, less than favorable season last year in their conference. But just talk to me about, you know, what you think they need to do to, to, to get the program back on track. Obviously, they do play in a tough OCC conference. Like, we just saw, saw Mansfield Senior. West Holmes is still a team out there, too, that's going to do some damage and be a top of the conference. But for Ashland, I think they're the most intense practice that we went out to. Their offensive linemen were really getting after it. We talked to Bryson Martin, the left tackle. That they, they, they really want to fire off the ball and really make the opponent, you know, scared of them. And that's kind of their mindset that they had when we were out there practicing. I feel like Ashland every year, they have the athletes. It's just sometimes they can't fully put it together. And John Metzger, the wide receiver out there, I think he's going to be the guy to lean on for the arrows if they want any chance of competing in a very tough OCC. Definitely, yeah. And, and I mean, like you said, those practices are intense. And they, and they got a lot of the newfangled equipment, like the football throwing machine, things like that. So, I mean, just tell me what you saw. What were the big things you saw intensity-wise out of them uh, that you think is going to help them out through the rest of the season? Well, you know me, Storm, former offensive lineman. I love to go film offensive lines. And they, by far, 
were like the hardest, like training, most intense. They were, I mean, they were getting after these guys, and this was still involuntary too. So this wasn't even mandatory yet when we went out there, and they were just getting after it, man. And then the wide receivers too. They got guys who can fire off the ball, cover well. The only, the only thing I fear about them is just they play in such a tough conference, you know. And then they got to go on the road to week one and play Norway. And I'm not sure how Norway's going to stack up against them. So I think for Ashland, they got to start out of the gate fast and get a big win on the road against Norway, and maybe see if what they can do down the line. We can definitely tell that they got a chip on their shoulder in that tough OCC conference, but only time will tell uh, uh, where they're going to go from here. So yeah, back to you, Ski. I don't think there's any question. Uh, OCC is going to be much improved. Eric Madison right. with the new coaching staff. We're expecting Ashland to take a little bit more of a step up. They add new Philly. But West Holmes, that's the team 14-0 and out of the gates last right. year. Best season in program history. And they got a lot of pieces back. Do you feel like that that is the team that is the one that's got the target on their back? Are they the favorite in the league? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, that league to me, there's there's three schools at the top of it, and then there are other schools that can that can change who's at the top of that. So I'll give you an example. I think West Holmes is the favorite coming in. They got to get their quarterback situation ironed out. They're losing Clark. Kid was an absolute stud, but they do have Williams Dixon back, and I like him as an athlete. I mean, that kid's a big Love time him. prospect. Uh, Worcester's always going to have their hand in it, and obviously we already talked about Mansfield. I think those three are the clear cut favorites in that league. I think it goes through them. Teams that can that can have a say in it, that are kind of on the outside, could knock on the door. Ashland, New Philadelphia. I think they're right in there. And then you throw in a Mount Vernon, a Madison, and a Lexington, and we've just got to see where they're at in their programs. Uh, Madison and Lexington, both with new head coaches. Uh, Lexington's got an extremely young roster, but I think that they're going to be up and coming. But I like what Co Coach Valentine, if anybody can get this group ready to go, it's going to be him. Uh, there's not a better coach in the area. As a matter of fact, Ashland is a is kind of an area brand because of Scott Valentine. So if anybody can restore order in Madison and quick order, it's Scott Valentine. Yeah, those are all really good points. Should be a really fun yeah. league to watch from week to week, see how it all shakes out. Flip the page now. Let's talk more about the MOAC. And I think that there is just one team, at least in my mind, that is going to be the front runner, and that is the Clear Fork Colts. Checked him out of practice just this last week. Let's go out there to the valley. You know, we have approximately 68, 69, 70 kids uh, on the team. We have a couple of uh, younger kids we're not sure about, but uh, we probably had 50 plus at every workout in the summer. And you know, that to me, that's pretty good because you got kids playing baseball or basketball or they're on vacation or whatever. Um, so, you know, as far as that stuff goes, summer attendance was, uh, you know, it was pretty darn good for, you know, every school's a little different. I know there's some schools out there say we get 100% attendance, whatever, that's great for them, but uh, I've never experienced that before. So, you know, we're at, you know, 85, 90% every day. Uh, pretty happy with that. The biggest thing that um, I think this group needs to realize and and uh, you know and it's it's their choice is that they have to do things correctly we have the size we have speed and we have experience uh, now it's going to come down to discipline you know do we you, you know are you just going to do what you can get by with uh, are you going to practice down to the level of the guy you know that's on the JV team that's across from you or are you going to you know we try to tell the kids you know Every, every day in practice, you're not practicing against our scout team. You're practicing against Shelby. You're practicing against Highland. You're practicing against Lucas. You know, all the good teams that we play or, the, or teams that you possibly could play in the playoffs. And, you know, so it's it's that effort, you know, which I, I think is all about toughness and, and discipline. If we do those things, uh, we have a chance. And that's what, that's what we're after. We want our program to be fighting for a league title every year. And... Um, you know, I, I think you know we have that. I'm not sitting here saying we, we we're going to win the league title. I've never ever say anything like that, no matter how good a team we had coming back or whatever. Um, but um, you know, they're, they're, the team, the, the the league title is always going to go through Shelby in my mind. They have a great program. They understand what it takes to win up there and everything that they do. Uh, they have good athletes. Uh, you know, their their kids buy in and they're they're in the weight room. They're they're probably one of them teams that has 100 percent attendance. Um, and we know what we're up against with them every year. I, you know, I know they graduate a bunch of studs, but they got a bunch of them back. They got good kids back, and they got good kids coming up. 
and Highland's got a first team all Ohio, 220 pound running back. It's an animal coming into our league. And, you know, we still play Granville, who went to the semifinals in D3. And, you know, you have one of the best programs in the state of Ohio in D7 and with Lucas week one. I know that's not, those aren't league teams, but uh, you, you got Lexington over there that uh, isn't real happy with Clear Fork, uh, what, what happened the last couple of years. So, you know, we got, we got a tough way to go, but, you know, if we do things right, we have a chance. I mean, if we're tough and we're disciplined, um, you know, I think we can be in the mix. I've um, been working hard, a lot of football, uh, a little bit of basketball throughout June, but main focus is on football and on Lucas as of right now and just in the weight room, throwing the ball with friends out here and just practice after in the weight room and all kinds of football stuff, seven on sevens and all that. Uh, I think probably our confidence is most up from last year. This year we know we're good and we know we're going to be good and we're ready to go, but last year I think we weren't really sure how good we we're going to be through going through summer, but now I think we're ready to go. I think, I mean, I think we're going to win the MOAC and that's our expectations, but uh, I don't know. I think uh, you know, all the people on the hill beside the bleachers and everything is sweet and we always have a good student section going and the band's always really good and it's just everything about Friday night's perfect. Um, I think we can, we just got to go out and play hard. I, I think we're... We probably have more athletes, bigger, a little bit bigger, but they're just good year in, year out, and they run a weird offense and all that, but I don't know, I think we're pretty confident. And going back to my sophomore year, two years ago, we played them here, and they beat us. There was a lightning delay in the middle of the game, but they beat us that year, and I, a lot of us played sophomore year that are seniors now. I think like eight of us played in that game. So I think we're ready to go this year, and we all still remember that. I think our experience is huge. I mean, we have a lot of guys that played since sophomore year. We all played last year, and we had a decent season last year, and now we're all, we're all seniors this year and one last time. Hayden, you were down there. You made that video. Uh, this could be a special year for Clear Fork. You got Victor Skoog back at quarterback. You got a couple transfers in from Bay Village as well. And a, a young defense last year that's back with everybody. And it, it seemed like they're going to do some damage this year. Yeah, you know, when I went out to practice, um, Coach Dave Carroll definitely has them ready, Trav. You know, I think we all expect that. Um, just the caliber and the, the level of expectation in that program now. He's definitely got a culture set. Um, down in the valley, but as you mentioned, they bring in a couple of transfers from Bay Village that are providing a lot for them offensively. Take some of that pressure off Victor, who kind of had to be a running back and quarterback last year. Uh, so that allevi alleviates some of the pressure off of him to try and do his duty at quarterback. He's still going to scramble. He's still going to run and pick up his yards on the ground, but more of an opportunity for him to try and air it out now. Um, they do have a couple guys on the outside that, again, have speed and can get open. And then defensively, I know that's where some of the anxiousness lies for them, but I think it's just the brand of football they've been playing. Um, you know, I don't want to throw them out there and compare them to the level of someone like Lucas that just is a plug and play team each year, at, you know, every year. But I think Carroll has that kind of coaching caliber to him that he's able to plug the guys into the right spots and then they're going to just reload every year and be ready. So I think the brand of football in the MOAC, you know, and the competition they play in year in and year out is going to, you know, help elevate them towards the top. Yeah, and I got to see them right after Mansfield Senior. I went down and saw the Clear Fork scrimmage against Tenora. And I think Clear Fork and Mansfield Senior will have two of the better defenses this year, guys. Um, they were just swarming the ball. Coach Dave Stepka comes from Madison down to a defensive role for the Clear Fork Colts, and I think it's a good fit. But, you know, with the offense, they have they had two quarterbacks running in there as well, not just Victor Scoob, but another one. So they might have that two-quarterback system again. We'll have to see when it comes to the regular season. But, you know, they have those pieces that – they might be able to, you know, run the table, win the MOAC, but they have, you know, the, the likes of Shelby and Galley and Harding. I know we just found out that Harding, their coach, no longer there with the team. But then you have also Highland. That's a team coming in from the KMAC now to the MOAC. They got one of the best running backs in the area as well. So, you know, week 10 could be, you know, that last hurdle for Clear Fork to win a conference championship is down at Highland. The expectation definitely is that I think Clear Fork's going to be near the top of the conference competing for a crown, but we we got to talk about the three-time defending champions here, Eric Shelby. A lot of question marks out there 
you think they can answer some of those questions throughout the season, or are they maybe going to slip off and not be a contender for a season? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, here's the thing. We're going to get answers, Brian. We just don't know if, if people in Shelby are going to like those answers. Does Good that point. make sense? And, sure. and, and sometimes, and maybe they will. We don't know. Uh, we do know this. Clear Fork, I believe, has, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they have 20 of their 22 guys back from last year's team. Their entire line is intact. They bring in a running back from Bay Village. Right. Uh, they, you know, I'm sure, you know, um, he, he's going to be a solid football player. I just know what the known commodity is. You can't look at this and just say, well, they've won three straight league titles. You have to, the, the, you know, those teams have already played. They're done. We're looking at this year's team. Shelby's probably going to have a say in it. I just would pick Clear Fork to be a, a, a clear favorite in that argument. Uh, we know this. Clear Fork's going to be extremely physical. They're going to run the football. You're going to have to out-physical them, and now they're going to have the athletes because we've been hearing about this class coming up this, that's now juniors, and so this is their time to shine. There are going to be roadblocks in there. Trav brought up uh, uh, Highland. I think that's going to be a, an obstacle. Shelby will be an obstacle. Um, and if you're in Shelby, hey, you're the league champion. If I'm Dave Carroll, I'm doing exactly what he says in that video. Hey, we got to beat Shelby. I, you know, he doesn't want that bullseye. They're the three-time league champion, not me. So um, I would be playing that up the exact same way. Uh, you know, Galleon, I think, is going to be much improved. But I do think Clear Fork is the uh, – Clear Fork has an opportunity. If they get by, I believe it's Granville, right? that they play, or is it Grandview? Granville. Granville. If they get by Granville, they're going to be a real tough out. I, 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 think, I think they're going to be that good. I think that they are the clear-cut favorite you know, to, to win the MOAC. That's just my opinion on, on what you see coming back, and I love what they have up front. When you can solidify your offense and defensive lines, yeah. and you know who's coming back, they are a known commodity, and they have size, they have speed. They have athleticism. Uh, that makes life for your quarterback difficult on one side when you're when you're the opposing team, and then it allows you to run the football. I don't know if Victor Scoo is going to have to throw the ball 15, 20 times a game. I don't think that's going to have to. I, I think he's going to throw the ball eight to 15 times, and it might be just to do it to get it on film because I think they're going to be able to line up and run the football on pretty much anybody. Well, this season we're going to do something a little bit different on the pigskin. Each of our OH reporters are going to have a designated conference where they are going to be our insider. So Storm Blunchley is going to be our guy for the MOAC. Give me some quick predictions here, Storm. You saw Shelby a bunch last year, but a lot of the guys that you saw not going to be there. Are they going to drop off? Is Clear Fork the favorite in your mind, too, in the league this season? You know what? It's going to be really tough for Shelby. And uh, kind of like how Eric was saying, we're going to get answers. It's just I don't know if the uh, Shelby fan base is going to like them. I definitely see them competing for a league title. It's just going to be not as easy as it was last year, that's for sure. As far as Clear Fork goes, uh, I'm really high on Victor Skoog. I really love the guy. And uh, I, I really think he's going to carry this Clear Fork team. I think he's going to be doing a lot for him, And uh, I think he's going to have a, a very impressive year, both through the air and on the ground. So I think Clear Fork's the favorite, but you do have a sleeper team like Galleon who could make a run. Shelby's always in contention. And now even Highland's in it. So. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm, I'm pretty skeptical. I, every team's got their flaws. But, I mean, if I had to pick, I, I'm probably pick, picking Clear Fork to, to win it all this year. So it looks like, yeah, kind of the general consensus, Dave yeah. Carroll's bunch, they got it going on. Well, and, and, and real quick, sorry, Brian, just, you know, Ontario. You know, we, we've talked about some of the other schools. Haven't even mentioned yet, yeah. Right, and, and, and when you look at a Studer coming back, for them, this is the new co Aaron Eckert's, you know, been a head coach before. Uh, I'm really curious to see what he's able to do. And it comes right out of the gate week one against Lexington. I think right. that could set the tone for their season. So I just I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up Ontario because their junior class has been highly touted as well. Good point. And, and I know – this is a big year for them. Like just just from I think from a from a mental approach. You know what I mean? Like so so I'm I'm excited to see Ontario. I, I you know, I'm going to be down there. I'm going to be calling that game. So I'm excited to see Ontario and Lexington play OCC MOAC and both are really trying to do the exact same thing. Kind of just light a fire under their program. And so I'm excited if I'm Ontario, they have talent. I'd be saying, man, everybody's overlooking us. So uh, we'll see what Coach Eckert and that group can bring.
Yeah, including us. I'm glad that you brought them up because you're right. Yeah. This junior class right now, they've been talking about them for a couple seasons, so now it's kind of put up or yeah. shut up, but we'll see if they produce this season. Well, a team that definitely did last year in the Firelands Conference, the Crestview Cougars, all they did was go 10-0 during the regular season campaign. And, of course, a lot of pieces back, so they got high expectations again this fall. <laughs> Numbers are good. I think we've had throughout the weight room, we were in the low 40s. Um, I think we got 35 to 40 out there in camp right now. Um, so that's been good since it is volunteer. Uh, we got some guys on vacations and little things like that, which we know about. Um, but show, that shows the dedication that they put in. I think that that's where they know that, um, yeah, even though we lost to Kerry last year and um, in that regional semifinal, that, that we're a pretty good football team. and. Uh, we got a lot of guys coming back. Uh, we lost six contributing seniors uh, that we have to replace, but uh, we think we can do that with the guys that we have. Oh, it, it helps a lot. Um, the, the culture is really just always give 110 percent, no matter what. You know, we'll get, uh, we'll face adversity every game. Like there's no game without adversity. You just have to overcome that adversity and come back and not put your head down. So Garrett, uh, obviously we've been spending a lot of time uh, out with the Crestview Cougars and a uh, very successful season last year, but uh, a lot of teams in the Firelands Conference getting a lot better this year. Just talk to me about who you think is going to be kind of the, the biggest question mark for the Cougars on their schedule and uh, who do you think is going to give them the most run for their money? I, th I mean, obviously I think you have to circle St. Paul. I mean, that, that's a given. I want to talk about that much, but obviously it's it's been St. Paul's Firelands Conference for so many years, and fi finally Crestview beats them. I don't think you can just give the crown straight to the Cougars again this season. I think you still have to, you know, respect St. Paul and what what they're about and what that program's about. But I think a team that I think it's gonna be tough to compete with any with a Crestview or a St. Paul. But I think Plymouth has a shot to at least maybe uh, shock some teams in that Firelands Conference. They're returning seven starters on both sides of the ball. Shea Sparks an All Ohio kid too. So and they love to run the ball down your throat. So. I think if any team in the Firelands Conference that's a sleeper, I think it's Plymouth, but I think Crestview and St. Paul, I think it's a two-team race to win that. And Garrett likes a Hayden Kuhn, Owen Barker, Addison Raymer, a lot of returning guys. No Connor Morris this year, and you know Hayden Kuhn, he's no Victor Skoog, but who do you see kind of uh, really taking the taking the leadership role You know, now that Connor Morris isn't there? Well, Strong, we've been out there. We've seen multiple guys step up in many different ways. Mason Ringler is one of their offensive line, and that's a good thing about the Cougars. Their entire front seven and – uh, for the offensive line, they all return for the majority. Of, uh, so I think Mason Wrangler is going to step up, but I don't think it's going to be one guy that's going to be able to, you know, step in the shoes of Connor Morris. I think he had around 30 touchdowns last year. I don't, I don't think they're getting that from any of their running backs on the roster, but you never know. I think it's going to be a collection of guys. Addison Raymer, you mentioned Owen Barker, Caden Cunningham, a guy that's been predominantly on the defensive side of the ball. He's going to be playing out wide on the wide receiver position. So the Cougars, I mean, I, they got a lot of hype, but they got to prove it to us once again. We didn't know if they were going to be able to do it last year. They were able to, but you got to do it again to be great. Definitely, and it is not going to be an easy task, not in the regular season, not in the playoffs if they are to make it that far. So it is definitely not going to be easy for them in the Firelands Conference. Eric, I think you kind of see it otherwise. You, you feel like maybe not a cakewalk for the Cougars in the Firelands, but you, you feel like 10-0, and 0, definitely on the table. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think the toughest test they're going to have is in their non-conference. I think conference-wise, they're going to be totally fine. 
Uh, starting off with Lucas, that's a tough game. No way around. You know, even when Lucas, we, we get it. Lucas has graduated basically their entire offensive line. I, I'm, I'm still going Coach Spittler, Spittler plug and play. I still like Crestview in that game. I believe they're playing Highland as well. Uh, if I remember that correctly, which is going to be another quality opponent with a great running back coming in. To me, the only question that has to be answered for uh, Crestview is the running back. And I think they can do that by committee. I think they'll be fine there. Once again, what do they have? Known commodity. Their offense and defensive lines, and then you put the signal caller behind it. I think they're going to be I think they're going to be about a sure thing to win a conference championship. Now, if I'm Coach Haverdill and, I, and, 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 and I'm listening to Eric Will speak, I'm saying do not turn on the OH report and listen to this clown. Um, I, I, I get that. But I'm just saying th they are locked and loaded and poised to have a great season. Now, who could upset that? I think G said G had a good take. I, I do agree with him on um, – I think Plymouth is going to be a pretty good football team. Who knows with Monroeville? They're up and down. You never know what you're going to get with Monroeville, but they're normally a physical team. I, I believe New London doesn't have football again this year. I think Correct. they're eight, seven man, eight man, whatever, they, whatever they're doing. I, I, Mapleton, Western Reserve, I don't think they're going to have the horses to go with it. So – I think that St. Paul game is going to be just like last year. It's going to probably be, no matter where it is in the season, I believe it's in Norwalk this year. So that's going to probably be a de facto conference championship game. And I actually think Plymouth, this could be a really good Plymouth team. It's just, man, Crestview's really, really good right now. I just, I'm really high on Crestview. I was high on them last year. I think I'm higher on them this year. And I think they can make that. I, to me, I'm excited to see them go through the steps this year and stay locked and loaded because I want that that playoff run. I, I, I want to see them get back and, and and the lessons they learned from last year. I want to see that play out this year. Yeah, perfect segue now because let's go ahead and move on and talk about the Northern Ten, where the team that knocked Crestview out of the playoffs last year and oh by the way, the Division Six state champion Kerry Blue Devils are in there. They lost a lot. They got a lot of talent coming back, though. They're just inexperienced. And then you look at Colonel Crawford, the team that finished second in the league. They lo lose a ton, too. Outside of them, no other team in the Northern 10 finished with a winning record. So Hayden Gray is going to be kind of our insider this season in the N10. When you look at it from top to bottom, Mr. Gray, do you feel like this league is as wide open as any that you can possibly picture? Because I don't feel like there is a front runner that you look at the roster from top to bottom and say, hey, 20 guys coming back or 15 starters or something, there's a lot of questions to be answered still. I do agree. Um, I do think that it tends to be one of the most open conferences that we're going to take a look at and with the one with the most question marks. I'm um, just reading a lot of other area previews. Um, and I think a lot of the coaches in the N10 agree as well. I think a lot of them have said it's a meat grinder of a conference um, and that it's absolutely week to week. Any given team could beat any one of them. Um, whether it's home away, no matter the matchup. Um, you know, you bring up, obviously, Carey. They lose four All-Ohioans, their quarterback, their running back, um, you know, core pieces. But the one thing they do bring back is a lot of their defensive core. Um, they bring back their two leading tacklers, and I think their defense will be their strength this year. Um, if they're going to get things done, it's going to have to be on the defensive end of the ball, and they're going to have to just slow down other teams. Um, not a lot of those Northern 10 teams towards the bottom once you got past Colonel Crawford are high-scoring offenses, so that could work in their favor. Um, and so then we go look at Colonel Crawford. Again, they lose, you know, 10-plus starters from last year. Um, they do bring back a single All-Ohioan, but they bring back their quarterback from last year as well, you know, over a 1,000-yard passer, a 10-plus touchdown thrower. Um, and, you know, they're going to play, I think, very motivated football this year, obviously with the unfortunate passing um, of their head coach. I think that's one of those where sometimes, you know, that really fuels a team as well, um, even if they're not the highest caliber players, that really brings a team together. So I think that I've looked at Mohawk um, and talked with Garrett before about how I think Mohawk, they bring back a guy like, Caden Allen and Zayden Fry, who I think could be a decent backfield together. I don't know if it's going to be enough to get around those defenses. So the more I've juggled back and forth, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised to see Kerry compete for it again. Um, I don't think that Colonel Crawford will take the league this year. Um, but I could see those teams, Mohawk, Colonel Crawford, and Kerry kind of being in that top three. Um, but another team that, you know, we talked about, Garrett's brought it up, Eric's brought it up, is Upper Sandusky. Um, they're a team who last year just had three wins, um, but they've had a great young core. Um, they bring back that, and they have a lot of experience, and sometimes this might be one of those years where they piece it together. Yeah, good info there. And 
Yeah, you, you just think about all the different teams and the possibilities of how things can shake out here, Eric. Uh, can, can you make any sense of this in the preseason from what you know right. about these squads yet, or do, do we need about three, four weeks before we start making some decisions? Well, I mean, I, I, I Hayden gave a phenomenal breakdown there. I, I would start with Kerry. I do, I because I, I know you know that their defense is going to be really, really good. If, if we don't know anything about anybody else, we know their defense is going to be solid. I like Upper Sandusky, too. They bring back a whole bunch of pieces. I think they're going to be solid. Winford's got a new head coach. They're kind of starting almost a new – this is a little bit of a rebuild. It's the first time we've seen this in 15, 20 years at Winford. I mean, I we haven't seen more. it. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since Winford hasn't been a really known commodity coming back with saying, oh, that team's going to really have an effect on the league. And they could. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly what they have coming back and all of those things, but I know Winford traditionally is a, is, is a really good program. I, I like Colonel Crawford. I think Colonel Crawford's going to have a say in this. They have some pieces coming back that are pretty good. Like like uh, Hayden was talking about, Coach Teglovic, just a quality guy. The community loves him. Um, you know, and, and so we're going to see that component. That psychological component is going to be huge. And then you throw in a Seneca East. The last five to seven years, they've had some quality teams roll in and out of that stadium. So, you know, it's just – it's probably the most – unknown conference because so much talent across that league has graduated and we've seen some coaching turnover as well um, and, and so that's why I'm sticking with Kerry out of the gate but I think you're right I think we're going to be sitting here weeks two three and four and saying oh okay that makes sense that Mohawk their backfield's really taken off like Hayden was just talking about so it, it's going to be a competitive conference. All right, our final league inspection tonight is going to take us into the KMAC. And I was down in KMAC country today checking out the defending champion East Knox Bulldogs who have a brand new head coach at the helm. And I got a chance to talk with Andy Beatty about what it's like trying to replace all those studs that they had, some pretty legendary players out there for the Bulldogs. Here's what he had to say. What are some of the conversations internally with the team as far as expectations? What are some benchmarks that you're trying to put out there that you don't want to like overhype yourselves? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a small community, so we know what people are saying, both you know, somewhat locally and and in, in the teams that we play. So we know, you know, everybody's knows the same thing we do. You lost seven starters, six starters on the other side of the ball, and some legendary players that have been around for a long time. And uh, so, you know. Our biggie is this idea of earn the right, you know, earn the right to be a leader, earn the right uh, for people to know your name and what you're doing and accomplishing. And these young men have risen to that that challenge uh, and kind of taken it personal, honestly. I think you'll see them playing uh, with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder at times because they hear the noise, they know what's being said. All right, Eric, so they lose their three-year three -year starting quarterback in Peyton Lester. Mm -hmm. They lose a four-year starter in Shane Nepp that was, I think, a record setter for just about everything, defense and offense for them. And you were in the same position in Shelby in 2018. You right. graduate all those studs. What is this process like for Coach Beatty right now, trying to plug in some guys into some places right. where you just had so much familiarity for so long that it probably mm -hmm. just feels a little bit weird at first? Yeah, and, and you got to got to get that continuity and that stuff taken care of in the winter and the spring. So right now they're rolling. He's feeling comfortable with his kids because these are his kids. He's been around them. He knows their strengths. He knows their weaknesses, and you have to play into that. And then the psychology of it saying, hey, that success, that championship banner that's up in our, our gym and probably on the back of our football stadium, that's last year's class. So what are we doing this year to ensure that your numbers go up somewhere in our building um, and that the 2022 team sets its precedent for, you know, Bulldog football moving forward? Uh, that's the big thing is it's easy for a long time to eat at the buffet of success. Sure. You know what I mean? When you've had a nice playoff run, when you've won a league title – that's why they always say the, the – which I think they say the second hardest thing, but I think it's the hardest thing, but it's to build a winner and then maintain a winner. And that's what he's been tasked with. Coach Beatty's been tasked with maintaining that winner. And so he inherits a conference championship team. Now, when you're in another coach's position where you're coming in, you're inheriting something that wasn't very successful – Generally speaking, if you can get that thing moving at all, you're getting back smacks and, you know, everybody's wanting to hang out with you and tell you sure. how great you are. If you take a step back, oh, 
we, you know, we, we, the, the program was left with a conference championship. But, you know, each each year, each school is a little bit different. But that's what, that's how I would answer that is he probably knows the strengths and weaknesses of his players. I, I, I can guarantee he does. And then he's saying, listen, we have to focus on the task at hand this year with this group. Well, there was no other choice for us to be our insider for the KMAC. How about KMAC, Trav, of course. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, toss it over to you and Hayden. You've been spending a lot of time down there in KMAC country these last couple weeks. It's about time you got to one of the best conferences here in the area. <laughs> Let's go. Victor Skook. Yeah, we, we got some good quarterbacks Ooh. down here in the KMAC as well. Just kidding, Victor. But um, uh, you got to go down to Freddie Land, and I think I one, of the, one of our favorites for the conference, Fredericktown, returning a lot, Hayden. Yeah, you know, Fredericktown, they, you know, they return a lot of talent that was a core part of last year, even though it wasn't the most successful year. Um, they bring back their quarterback, Ben Mast, who only got to play in four games last year due to injury, um, but he's back at the helm. Um, they bring back Cade Carpenter, who gets to finally move back out to wide receiver in some slot now that he has a, doesn't have to take on some of that quarterback duty. And then also Tegan Rule on one of their key running backs. And, uh, you know, their whole offensive line almost returns as well. I talked to Ben a lot about the fact that they returned so much that they didn't have to spend a ton of time installing things. Um, but defense is definitely the biggest question for them. So um, without me saying everything, we'll go ahead and take a look at the Fredericktown preview. Yeah, we've had uh, a lot of numbers in the weight room, and I think that's been the biggest factor for us this year. Everybody's in there putting in the work. You know, we've had some rough practices here and there, but, you know, we have a great receiver group and a veteran O-line, and I think we can do great things this year and pretty tough defense, too. Yeah, uh, we have, you know, a lot of the guys, everybody knows the plays, so it makes it easier, you know, right off the rip, just being able to run our plays and not have to worry about reinstalling stuff. But I think at the same time, you know, the league's open to anybody, so we really got to work and make sure we do things the right way. Yeah, I think uh, just everybody got to stay healthy. You know, everybody stays healthy, does their work, and, you know, takes extra time to study film. And I think, you know, it's open to anybody who really wants it. Well, we've been really happy. We, we bring a lot of uh, uh, excitement and uh, um, a, a lot of co competition into camp here uh, as we enter two-a-days. Um, we've had really good turnout uh, throughout our summer workouts and our July camp days and our seven-on-sevens, and, and uh, that uh, momentum continues here in the early part of uh, two-a-days. Yeah, as you mentioned, we bring a lot of experience back on offense, so we want to go over to Pleasant uh, tomorrow and and hopefully get off to a good start, be really crisp uh, in our time, in timing and assignments tomorrow offensively. Uh, I think the big uh, challenge for us is we've made some adjustments defensively. We're looking at a new defensive look uh, and just see how well we play defense and, and how, how well the kids know their assignments, uh, their alignments and their fits and, and uh, you know how well overall we're going to play defense. I think that's the one thing we're, we're pretty anxious to see. Well, I mean, I think we're right there in the hunt. Um, there's there's a lot of talent this year in the KMAC. Uh, just off the top of my head, I mean, Danville has a tremendous amount of uh, talent coming back. Uh, you know, you got to assume that East Knox is going to be good. They, they did lose a lot of kids, but, you know, you know, they've got a lot of momentum over the last, they built a lot of momentum over the last few years. Uh, Northmore has some talent coming back. Uh, really, from top to bottom, the league is going to be very competitive. There's a lot of really talented seniors uh, throughout the the uh, league so from one week to the next it's really going to be a challenge but we feel that if we can execute and as you said build on a little bit of the success that we started to see uh, last year that we can have a really solid year and hopefully compete for that championship. Yeah I mean I think what you find here in this town is just a classic example of a small midwestern town that really gets excited about Friday nights and and you know it's an entire community event uh, the kids are really bought in I got a great group of coaches uh, to work with. Many of them played here at Frederick Town. Um, you know, I'm enter entering my 21st year uh, with the program, so uh, I've seen a lot of ups and downs. I've seen a lot of great memories out there, and and I just want to ho hopefully add to that uh, this year. As I said, there's just a lot of there's a lot of anticipation, a lot of excitement for this year.
So Hayden, you got to go down there, like I say, said, and see the Freddie Berg, the inaugural Freddie Berg Trophy champions, yeah. uh, returning one of the biggest rosters back with the likes of Cardington and Danville as well. But what did you like down there at the practice that you saw? Oh, well, what I liked was Coach Hartley runs a really, you know, clean and concise practice. It was a Friday. You could tell from the video, it's one of those end of the weeks. It was, you know, misting, rain coming down. End of the week, they're about to have a scrimmage the next day. So you don't know, you know, mentally, mindset-wise, how focused the guys are going to be. Uh, he definitely doesn't put up with any, you know, laxing around. He wants to make sure they're utilizing their time in the best way possible. Um, they just moved around really well. They they locked in, took it serious, um, acted like it was a game situation, especially with a scrimmage the next day. And I think that he's going to have them ready to go for sure. All right. Well, I got to go down to North Bloomfield Township to see the Northmore Golden Knights, a team that made it to the second round of the playoffs last year, a team that with two weeks remaining was in the lead in the K-Mac before a couple losses got them out of that conversation. They were they lose a lot of key players, but they do return the likes of Max Lauer and some defensive backs. I went down to the practice, and this is what they had to say. We lose, we lose 11 good seniors, many of those guys two-way starters, so um, we have a lot of people to replace, but the good news is uh, we've got a lot of program guys here that have been in here and they've gotten the reps in, freshman JV level, and uh, they've gotten the experience that they need to be ready to play. One of the fortunate things about having the numbers that we have is that we are able to play some freshman games and some JV games, and if those guys aren't playing, they're not getting any better. And uh, we're to the point in our program now where our seventh grade plays a schedule, our eighth grade plays a schedule, our freshman play a schedule, and, and we play JV. So those guys are getting reps, they're playing, they're, uh, they're staying involved, and when it's their turn to play, uh, they're ready to do it. Um, I think effort, it all comes down to effort. I mean, getting the reps in practice uh, against the older guys who've been in, the, been in here and getting the reps in, and that's the most important part. Um, we have a lot of DBs coming back and, uh, you know, working on the fundamentals every day, doing our back pedals, our opening our hips and everything, and really stressing the fundamentals is what makes us top tier. We just got to go hard every play. That's really all it comes down to is giving 110% every single play, every single quarter. That's all it takes. We have a quarterback who can throw the ball well. We have right receivers who can run and catch the ball well. And it really all just comes down to, like I said, giving it all every play and making sure that we give 110%. Now, Travis, obviously one of the most key players that Northmore Luffley does retain from last year is Maxton Lauer. Obviously, he's not the entire team, but a, a two-way player. Tell me how important it is to have him stay healthy and what can he, not single-handedly, but what will he be able to help with as a leader and a guy on both sides of the ball do for the Golden Knights? Well, the second leading rusher in the KMAC comes back. Dane Nauman moves over to the MOAC, so he is now the leading rusher coming back this season. But not only that, but on the other side of the ball, linebacker, helping that linebacker core. They lost a couple players due to graduation last year. Their defensive secondary is going to be one of the, the, the biggest things that they have coming back. They only lost, I think, one or two players of safety in one of their corners. But if they can get things going defensively and let Lauer you know, do his thing offensively, maybe complete a couple passes, something like down at clear fork, complete maybe eight or nine passes, but run the ball like Northmore has done, they're going to be all right. They're going to be all right like the likes of, of Centerberg, another team that lost a couple you know, players, due, a couple wide receivers, yeah. their quarterback uh, due to graduation. But uh, coming back this year, they also have high hopes once again. And here is their preview. Uh, well, we, we lost our quarterback. Uh, from last year on offense, um, you know, so replacing that. Um, some guys out in the skill positions as well uh, that we lost. Uh, I think our top couple receivers uh, out there, so replacing them. You know, up front, we have a good chunk of those guys coming back. Uh, so to be able to lean on that experience uh, while you get those other things figured out uh, should, be, should be pretty big for us. We just had a conversation before we came out today about consistency. You know, success is, when you talk about it, it seems pretty simple. You know, being consistent, uh, equates to being uh, successful and uh, you know that's the challenge for us um, you know in all different phases of the game mentally you know physically emotionally all those kind of things is uh, stay consistent on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, you know develop the habits you know that are conducive to being successful and 
you know, I think that's something that we all struggle with, you know, and are challenged at times. Um, you know, so, so for us, that's, that's the key. Uh, and it is every year that way, you know, and the more consistent you can, on a, can be on a day-to-day -day basis, the more successful you're going to be, you know, week in and week out on Friday nights. You know, so we had the guys last year who rotated in with the starters. So, I mean, it starts with them. Uh, it's, it's their gear. They need to step up. They need to, uh, you know, make some plays, make things happen. But I think, they, I think they're very capable of doing that, following in the footsteps of the guys who played last year. You know, I think it's just putting everything together, you know, working on, like, it, it comes down to the small details, really. You know, uh, catching football is just, just the little things, you know, work on tackling, just putting all our pieces together and making it, you know, run smoothly. Uh, we're it's looking great. Uh, we still got some work to do, but I I think in the long run we're gonna we're gonna be a great team. I think just some uh, communication and uh, talking with other players and getting together more will be part of the part of the job. Hard work and dedication, showing up every day and being optimistic. All right, Travis, so Centerberg, obviously you just talked about too. Yet another, you know, it's almost a broken record, but another team we're in high school football here that, you know, kind of needs to reevaluate who they have coming back. After finishing towards the top of the KMAC last year, you know, being out at practice, what were you able to at least gauge or take in that you can amount to how they'll measure up in the KMAC conference this season? Well, they're one of those teams that had enough players to fill in some roles that they lost. Jack Gregory now gone to the graduation. Tyler Johnson comes in now at quarterback. They have a couple, you know, what running backs that they use. They had three or four running backs that could run the ball for over 100 yards in a game last year. So they have a couple of them coming back. A uh, wide receiver, you know, they lost some key players there, but there's a couple players that can fill in and Tyler Johnson can find them. Their offensive line, I think, can hold the line defensively. That, that might be a bit of a question for them, but if they could get things going, they, they have high hopes this year, just like everybody else. And, uh, you know, they could be towards the top. But uh, I want to ask you a question, Hayden. Who do you think is going to be this team that comes out of this jumbled KMAC this year? Um, you know, right after the season and, and knowing who was going to be leaving, I still wanted to kind of allow myself to place East Knox at the top just because of how they're a, that team ca and that community captures your heart as a sports fan. But I think after kind of reevaluating, going down to Frederick Town's practice, talking with you about some of the teams that we've been seeing, I really like to lean towards Frederick Town this year just because I think they bring back the most offensive weapons. Um, they, you know, this is their 21st year um, where Coach Hartley has been a part of the program. They didn't have to worry so much about installing a whole new offense or anything coming in from this offseason. Um, they have the fewest questions to me, so I think the Freddies. Um, we'll finish up there towards the top, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a team like a Centerberg or maybe even Northmore who has one of these guys that can be the workhorse and do it all, you know, give themselves a chance. So to break it down from top to bottom, Mount Gilead, they had uh, one quarterback graduate. They have another one that transferred, and they have somebody, one of their key players get injured already. So that, that might be tough for them. Danville, Cardington, Danville. Fredericktown, they have the most coming back. Danville, I think they, they won four games last year. They made the playoffs before losing to a state finalist. And I uh, forget who they lost to. It was a team that lost to East Knox. Anybody want to help me here? No. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, they lost in the first round of the playoffs. Great job, guys. Appreciate that. Gloucester um, Trimble? Huh? No. Trimble? No. Who did, who did East Knox lose to in the regional final? Oh, uh, holy. Um, Newark Catholic. Newark Catholic. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Newark Catholic, they lost to in the first round. But three of their losses were to seven points or less. So they have mm -hmm. everybody coming back from Danville. Fredericktown has the most coming back. I think they, on paper at least, are the favorites in the KMAC. Cardington as well. They got a lot coming back. Then you have East Knox, Northmore, Centerburg, right in that middle. It, it just it depends. Do losing these key players uh, keep them from winning a KMAC and making a run of playoffs? We'll find that out. But I know. Coach, Coach Will, all these teams, for the Crestviews, for the Ma Mansfield Seniors, the Clear Forks, the Fredericktowns, we think have the ability to do, to do great. Is it agreeable enough to say that the biggest hurdle for these teams is their own self-confidence? Overconfidence usually gets in your way for, the, for some of these teams, and that might you know hurt them down the line if they are over, they're too overconfident? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different things at play there. If you've already done it, 
you know you, you know what's expected and you're continuing to do the thing that made you successful if you're like a clear fork and this group of guys haven't done it that's a little bit of a different situation because you don't want to put something around them or anoint them with something that they haven't earned does that make sense or that they haven't already tasted that's not already a part of their program they're trying to take that from somebody else so the mental approach to that's differently uh, depending on the school now I'll say this when you know you have a good team coming back what you're trying to battle against is is egos touches on the ball who's playing where people like us you know who's Brian Skaronsky and Hayden Gray and Travis Berardi who, who are they you know, who are these guys talking about on Friday night after the game? So when you're a head coach, I'm telling you, the biggest thing is just managing um, egos and making sure that psychologically that Saturday morning film that you're dialed in, that Monday when you come to practice, you're getting ready for that next opponent because you have to get a week better. Um, and, and I used to say this, Hayden heard this probably about 500 times in four years. The, the, the one thing that will kill success is selfish. Selfish and success cannot, they, they cannot coexist. Also, and I, I almost forgot one team that's coming into the KMAC this year, Loudonville, a team we'll say, mm -hmm. see on Thursday night at Crestview. Uh, that's another team. They have a lot of players coming back as well. It's going to be interesting to see how they fit into the conference, Brian, but uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a crazy KMAC season to see. I think Fredericktown right now, the favorites to win it, but uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out and maybe somebody's going to surprise us like usual. All right, guys, the last team that we're going to take a look at here tonight doesn't have a conference, but always high expectations. And that, of course, is the Lucas Cubs, a small school power right here in our own backyard. And even though they graduated 16 seniors, once again, this team feels like they're going to be playoff bound and a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, it's great to be back out on the field, you know, um, like he said, there's nothing really like it. And, you know, just playing with everybody and kind of getting more experience, everybody being together has just been great. And, you know, we're just really kind of having a ball out here. Um, you know, this year, I have to say, in the past 10 years, we've we got a tough schedule. Um, it's one of our years where people will say, Lucas isn't going to be as good as they have been. So we put that chip on our shoulder and we ride with it. And, I mean, we got teams like Magador, we got powerhouses. All, there's no week off. So we just got to keep our nose to the grind. and stay focused every week. Well, our own G-Man and Storm were out in the Lucas Valley just a couple of days ago. And other than cows and no cell phone towers, what did you guys see from the Cubs? Well, I think for Spittler and his staff, who, who is best at, at not rebuilding but reloading? It, it's Scott Spittler and his staff. It seems as if it's been multiple years where you know, Lucas is graduating, 15 seniors, blah, 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 and they continue to come back, and they're always making a deep run in the playoffs. So I think them graduating 16 seniors, it's hard to judge because I don't, I don't really know what to expect. I, I know what, what they do down there, and they usually just, they just regrow and rebuild, and they just reload, and they get ready to go. So they got a tough schedule. I know they play a couple key opponents. I know they got Magador on their schedule, but it's hard to judge with the Cubs. I know they got Finella coming back. They're senior running back, Corbin Toms as well. So... They're going to do what they do, ground and pound you, and we'll see what they can do. But they got a tough schedule, but you can't ever count out Spittler and his Cubs. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. I, I think that those other teams like Mogador, they look at their schedule and they say, oh, damn, Lucas is on our schedule. <laughs> so I think that kind of goes both ways. They're looking for, if I'm not mistaken, like their ninth straight playoff appearance. Right. And uh, I don't think there's any question with 16 teams getting in now, Eric, that they're, they're playoff bound, right? Absolutely. Uh, and here's the thing. What, let, let's look at what we know they have coming back. They have some skill coming back. See, last year was kind of the opposite. We knew they had that line coming back. Fair. You know, and, and they always plug and play. So we knew they had some young players. Uh, now when you look at it, you look at Finella, you look at Toms, they're going to be fine running the football. And I feel like just because of the way they practice – Listen, some teams like a Shelby, they're spending 20, 30 minutes in, in, in Skelly, right, doing seven on seven because they're going to throw the ball a ton. Lucas probably spends about five seconds a week <laughs> on Skelly. Yeah. So their entire disposition and the makeup of that team is you have, you, you have to either quit football or you better be able to do inside run. So that there's going to be a mentality down there that physically they're going to hit you and they're going to drive sleds. And Coach Spittler's going to have his DNA all over that offense and defensive lines. So 
Do I think Lucas is going to be good? Yes. Do I think they're going to be a playoff team? Yes. Do I think it's a travesty that they're not in a conference and they shouldn't be playing for conference championships? I, that drives me crazy. Yes, that, that is. Yes, Brian. Yes, that drives me crazy. Somebody needs to nab them up and get them in a conference. Um, they're, they're, it's too quality of a program. Um, and, and so um, it, that's, that's just driven me crazy for, for years here that they're not in a local conference. But, I, yeah, I, I have the utmost respect for them. And I think that it would be, quite frankly, I think it would be irresponsible of us on any level to, to question whether or not they've got to prove they're not going to be good. If that makes sense. Hey, I said on the podcast <laughs> on Monday, I am done questioning Scott yep. Spitler and thinking to myself, oh, are the Cubs going to be good this year? Yes. I yes. think that's the answer. That's right. All right. And then coming up on Monday on the podcast this next week, we are going to roll out our schedule for the season, tell you all the games that you can expect to see in week one in at least the first few weeks. Because guess what? It is football season, baby. It is here. And we got a ton of action coming up throughout the entire year. And then every Friday night at 1130 p.m. live right here on the Always Report, you can catch me and the gang right here on the Friday night. Thanks again. That's going to do it for now. Check out some live streams tomorrow.